And one of the biggest breakthroughs I found, which maybe should have been common knowledge, but I didn't know, is that it's much easier for children to develop a good hand shape if they play non-legato first until they're firmly in control of their forearm before they try to play legato and connect the fingers. You're listening to Tim Topham TV, the piano teaching podcast, and this is episode number 71. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Tim Topham TV. I'm very glad that you've got me in your earbuds, uh, wherever you are around the world uh, and whatever you're doing. Thank you very much. You're in the right place if you're looking to improve your piano teaching, to get a little bit more creative, to find out what is uh, going on around the world with all the best and new ideas. Uh, This is the place to be. So thank you very much for joining me today. And I know you're going to love the interview that I've got planned. And it is with the creators of Piano Safari which uh, is a new method that uh, has just been gaining a whole lot of popularity in the last few years, although they've been developing it for some time now. Uh, And the two guests today I have with me are Dr. Julie Nur and Catherine Fisher, the uh, two people who are behind Piano Safari. Now, I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of my time piano teaching, uh, searching for methods that really suit my beliefs about pedagogy uh, and the ways I work and the music that I like and you know all those kind of things. Um, and perhaps not. Perhaps you've been very happy with the method that you've got. Maybe you're on the other side of the fence. But I've searched around for a long time for something that I'm really, really 100% uh, happy with and I have found that in Piano Safari uh, and I've uh, recently started exploring it with some students and had some huge successes and great wins. And we're going to talk about why that is the case uh, very, very soon in this interview. Now, we've also got a very special offer for you. Uh, Julie and Katie have put together uh, a 15% discount for listeners of the podcast. If you are interested in grabbing some of their materials, uh, and I would highly recommend you do so, then you can just jump online and grab a discount very easily. To find out the information, what the dates are, and the coupon code you need, all you need to do is head to timtopham.com slash episode 71. That's where you go for the show notes, uh, links to anything we talk about in here, and of course, that very important discount code so that you can get started with Piano Safari. And I'm very excited to also let you know that if you're an Aussie, you don't have to buy and pay for shipping from the States, which is a fantastic a uh, fantastic opportunity to uh, to get involved in this method. Uh, there is a local distributor here in Melbourne that's being printed in Australia and uh, you can grab a copy for a very, very reasonable price, particularly with the discount. How good is that? So uh, Catherine Fisher and Julie, they developed the Piano Safari method during their time in school together at the University of Oklahoma. While graduate students, they realized they had a mutual dream of writing a piano method that would incorporate the best elements of the various techniques they had been using in their teaching. And as we'll hear, that uh, Julie in her PhD uh, explored with a whole lot of different teachers around the world. So Julie holds a PhD in music education with an emphasis on piano pedagogy. And her dissertation on elementary level piano technique was nominated for the Best PhD Dissertation Award in 2006. And it really forms the basis of much of what has gone into Piano Safari. So let's have a uh, a chat with Julie and Katie. I know you're going to enjoy this and get a lot out of it, regardless of what method you're using or whether you're even looking around at the moment. I know you're going to find a lot to uh, value in this interview. Here we go. Catherine and Julie, welcome to the show today. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. It's uh, it's very, very cool to have you guys on the show because uh, I think you already know, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a massive fan of Piano Safari, so I'm just going to say it right out, put it out there. It's a little bit starstruck star uh, meeting with you guys today. Um, and look, I've got to hand it to you. I reckon out of all the beginner methods I've tried, uh, and I've tried a lot in the last six years in order to blog about them and talk talk to my community about them, uh, Piano Safari wins hands down, no question at all. So thank you for creating such a great resource for us piano teachers. Thank you so much. So let's um, find out a little bit. I want to dig into uh, how it came about and a little bit about you guys. So firstly, can you tell us what your studios look like at the moment? Are you guys still teaching? You know, how many kids do you teach and that sort of thing these days? Sure. Well, um, this is Catherine speaking, and I I teach at Athens Community Music School at Ohio University. It's a community music school program um, where it's for 
children and adults in the community uh, to come in and take lessons with students um, and faculty at the university. So I currently coordinate the Piano Safari program for beginners, and these are group classes. And I also have about 15 private students ranging in age from very young through adult. Fantastic. And Julie, what does your studio look like? I teach at my home in Windsor, Connecticut, and I have about 23 students. Um, That includes kids from ages five to about 60. I have a couple adults, mostly kids. And then I have um, private lessons and also a couple partner lessons, which is lots of fun. And then in the past, I also taught some group piano. And obviously, together, you work on the business of Piano Safari. There must be uh, a fair bit going on in the background uh, with books and publishing and printing and goodness knows what. Uh, When do you get the time to do all that? It all happens out of my basement. Oh, does it? (laughs) (laughs) It comes from my basement, yeah. Yeah, we meet on Skype. We meet on Skype, and then I occasionally visit Ohio so that we can work together. Yeah, I was going to say, you're in two different states, right? Julie in Ohio. Catherine, whereabouts are you? I'm in Ohio, actually, okay. and then I'm in Connecticut. in Connecticut. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yep. <laughs> right. So I understand that the the creation of Piano Safari. I can't talk today. It's, I think it's the end. Of, it's coming up to the end of the year. Um, it's a Saturday morning at seven a.m. <laughs> I'm struggling today. I should have had a coffee. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I understand that um, the creation of Piano Safari came about as a result of Julie's PhD. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I'm just interested to know in, in what research you did as part of that and how that shaped your understanding of teaching. Well, Piano Safari actually came a little bit before my dissertation. Catherine and I met um, at the University of Oklahoma. I was doing my PhD and she was doing her master's degree. And we met in pedagogy class and both realized that we had always wanted to write a method, which um, seems a little strange, but uh, that had been one of our dreams. And um, we found out that we had very similar philosophies and had tried many different methods in our own teaching. And so we just started sketching things out. Um, And then when I went to do my dissertation, I wanted to do something practical. Um, And I did not have very good technical training in my pre-college years. So I wanted to make sure that I was teaching my students um, technically correctly at the beginning of study. So I made that my dissertation topic. Interviewed, it ended up being about 11 teachers well known for the pre-college teaching around the U.S. um, about how they teach technique. Um, So I would interview them and then um, spend an afternoon videotaping and uh, observing their lessons, which changed my teaching in absolutely every way possible. Mm. Um, Not only technique, but also the idea of teaching some by rote along with the reading. Um, A lot of the teachers I interviewed taught the beginners by rote some. So um, when we started writing a method, we had our system for reading sketched out, and then we decided to add rote pieces to spice things up before we realized that rote pieces have so many other benefits, which Mm. I'm sure we'll talk about a little later on. Definitely. I'm interested, uh, how did you choose the 11 people that you focused on? Um, I asked my uh, Jane McGraw, my um, dissertation committee chair, Um, And then also just looking for um, teachers that were well known for their pre-college teaching that had national prize winning students. And then of those teachers, finding the ones that still taught beginners Mm -hmm. um, and then contacting them and asking them if I could come. And by pre-college, just so people around the world understand, that means uh, school age or younger. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, before you go to college. Before you go, which is university, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So like 17 and younger. Yes. Okay, cool. But people that, but you're obviously most focused on people that were actually, although they were teaching high level and very experienced, they were still teaching the very beginners. Right. That's what I was looking yeah. for. Yeah. And can you, can you name a couple of those people that we might've heard of? Um, yeah, they came from lots of different technical schools of thought as well, which is something also I was looking for. Um, so I met um, Ella Karasik in Cleveland, Ohio, Um, Nina Polanski in Columbus, also Mary Craig Powell in Columbus, Ohio, and she's a Suzuki teacher. And then um, John Weems and um, Tu Carey in Houston, who are uh, more Taubman kind of Uh, um, teachers. And Marvin Blickenstaff, who uses his own kind of system. Yeah. Yep. So lots of different teachers like that. Suzanne Guy. Um, I'm, I have a list. I'm sure I'm leaving yeah. some out. No, 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 it that's was okay. kind of a long time ago right now. <laughs> but it, it, it really goes 
now that I know that, it makes so much more sense about how you see these kind of elements of Kadai, you, you see elements of Suzuki in the rote, uh, it, bits and pieces of everything have been mixed together. And I think that's the strength of Piano Safari. Uh, right. because Carolyn, so Carolyn Schock. Yeah, I wanted to mention Carolyn Schock in Denver. Um, her lessons might have stuck with me more than any others. It was amazing to watch how she deals with the students and just uh, the free flowing way that she did that with the rote teaching and with her technique looking so good from so young. Um, and then all the different props and stuffed animals she used and Mary Craig Powell uses props too. The whole experience changed my teaching forever, yeah. which I don't know if a lot of people can say that about their dissertation. <laughs> so I was really happy about that. No, absolutely. It's like the ultimate, isn't it? And did, yeah. you, did you have much uh, pushback from teachers going, oh, hey, I don't know about having people record and sit in my piano lessons? Well, um, I don't, I think I only contacted a couple teachers that um, said they didn't really want to participate, mm -hmm. um, but I really didn't get much of that. They were happy to have me um, and uh, they were really welcoming. And oh, that's so good. It was great. Yep. Yeah, well, and this wouldn't be the method that it is now had they not said yes, I'm sure. So it's great, isn't right. it? <laughs> Well, I know if, when I have observers, teachers observe me, I always teach better anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have observers. <laughs> That's true. Even, even having uh, parents watching, I think, can sharpen you mm -hmm. up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Catherine, I'm interested to know, you, you know you've, you've decided quite early on to start a method, which I didn't know this is the order of how it all came together. I mean, that's, it's a very busy market uh, to be entering. There are, and there are massive publishing companies behind some very, very big methods. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you ever kind of wonder whether you were both a little bit crazy to try and try and do this at the beginning? <laughs> oh, we definitely did. Um, we really started it just because we love pedagogy and we loved uh, debating pedag pedagogical topics and we wanted to improve our own teaching by creating something we could use with our students. So that's really where it grew out of, not so much... Um, we're going to write this method and, and get it published. And um, that wasn't our our main goal when we began writing it. So Got it. as Piano Safari has gained in popularity recently, we're just so thankful and um, excited about mm. that. Yeah. So well, we can share our work with others. Yes. It was uh, it was great to see you guys present too at uh, MTNA. I think that was another reason that I had to get in touch with you guys because I saw you in action. <laughs> then I tried you and tried it out with one of my students had great fun. So uh, yeah, it's really, really uh, exciting to uh, to explore it. So let's let's dive in a little bit deeper now. Um, one of the things I really love about the method is this connection you make between animals and technical maneuvers at the piano, because it really, uh, really works with kids. They kind of get it and they can remember things. So I'm interested to know how you came up with it. And um, maybe you could give us a couple of examples for teachers that aren't familiar with how you approach this. Sure. So that's the part that came most directly out of my um, dissertation research uh, because of the teachers that I interviewed with their various technical backgrounds. Um, I boiled that all down to the commonalities among all the teachers. Um, and then there were a certain set of motions or what you call technical maneuvers. I like that <laughs> word, maneuvers, um, that all, pretty much all the teachers used. Um, with their beginners. So that it, we turned into the seven animal techniques because, um, for instance, one of the, the first technique exercise um, is an arm drop just to help the student find their arm weight. But it's much more fun to call it the lion paw than the arm drop. Yeah. And then once we started calling it the lion paw, then we're like, well, we should get a stuffed animal that has a floppy arm. And so then we use the stuffed animals with the really little kids um, to explain this lion has a floppy arm. Is your arm floppy? Can you flop it on the piano and wake the lion up? And I make the lion like really scared when they do a good drop on the piano and they just laugh and laugh. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it works with all ages. You just have to use the animal with the kids that it's going to work best with. Mm. Um, and then the other, another interesting um, exercise was the Zechariah Zebra one, which sounds like has that rhythm. Um, and that was a mystery to me because uh, in my original research study with four teachers before I did the extra seven or whatever later, um, three out of the four teachers used that exercise. 
And I had never really? thought of doing something like that before. All Mary right. Craig Powell, Carolyn Schock, and Marvin Blickenstaff. And they all had different names for it. Uh, Mississippi Hot Frog, Colorado <laughs> Mountain, Ebenezer Sneezer. But it's all the same rhythm. Yeah. And they played it um, you know, on one note. And so I asked Mary Craig, Powell, I'm like, why do you do this weird violin Suzuki thing, you know? <laughs> and she said that um, the reason are is it helps them develop a loose arm to play repeated notes fast. You have to have a loose arm to be able to do that. And then the other reason is it's much easier to develop firm fingernail joints, uh, those end joints that tend to collapse mm. uh, if you're playing repeated notes rather than consecutive fingers. So playing on one finger really helps firm up those joints. So that was just a revelation to me. I had no idea. And then we work on it one finger at a time so that they know how to play each finger individually. So the thumb is up on its corner playing. Um, finger two and three are the easiest fingers. Finger four needs to stand a little bit taller so that the elbow doesn't pull it back. And then finger five plays on its outside corner. And gradually the kids will develop their hand shape on each finger like that. Yeah, absolutely uh, revelationary to me as well. I thought it was was great, and it's you know it's it's such a simple concept and a simple pattern that taught in the right way can have huge impact because we all know about those kids we get who have the collapsed knuckle, that last knuckle joint, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. it becomes increasingly difficult to fix as they get older. Uh, I often get transfer teenagers with, with that issue, and it's really really difficult uh, to fix when. Potentially, if they were taught with using a, a method like this, they could have had that right from the beginning. And when we started writing Piano Safari, I mean, both Catherine and I had used many different methods. And if you really read through beginning, beginning methods, there's not much instruction about technique. There's the notes on the page, but it, there's not a lot of instruction about whether they should be played non-legato or legato with the arm, with the fingers not a lot there. So that's part of the reason I did my research is to find out the best way. And one of the biggest breakthroughs I found, which maybe should have been common knowledge, but I didn't know, is that it's much easier for children to develop a good hand shape if they play non-legato first until they're firmly in control of their forearm before they try to play legato and connect the fingers. And then once they do start playing legato, they should still have the arm involved on every note to stay aligned behind the arm. Um, and to produce a good tone because we have a modern piano with heavy action. So very small children aren't going to be able to produce a good tone with only their fingers. And also if you play with just your fingers, then it's likely you'll get stiff in your arm unless you have super awesome control, which kids don't have yet. So um, non-legato first, then legato, and then gradually refining the arm motions for longer and longer phrases. And I think for people listening, I, I think this is one of the most crucial things that you have taught me in teaching beginners is this non-legato touch and you talk about it a lot in all the um you've got a lot of resources online about your approach and reminders for each lesson about how you should teach various things and my natural tendency was always to go and get kids to play legato as soon as i could because that was the ultimate goal right and you have made me rethink that completely and i can totally see the benefit of of having students play non-legato and be able to use their whole arm and get the finger shape and everything right and everything coordinated together early on. So I think even if, if teachers are listening to this and they don't use your method, totally cool, obviously. One thing I would say is the thing I've learned from you guys is don't get students to play legato early on because it just mm -hmm. doesn't help their technique. I think that's been yeah, really great to learn. I have, a new, I have a new student who just started last week, but she's a transfer student. She's about to turn seven. She's been playing the piano for two and a half years already. <laughs> um, she came playing completely flat fingered with no arm motion at all. And it took her fully five minutes to get on her fingertips and start playing non-legato. So kids, when they're young, will just soak, soak up whatever you want them mm. to do pretty easily it's much harder to fix technique once they get older yeah much harder mm -hmm. and do we need to buy you we've mentioned some fluffy toys as teachers of this method do we need to suddenly go and buy a whole lot of fluffy toys for our studios you can add them in gradually um, as you go you know it, it's not a requirement to teach the animal techniques but it's definitely um, engaging for young children so we actually have a teacher who just wrote a blog post um, on where you can find uh, stuffed animals 
um, and she gave links from Amazon. So I'm not sure um, how that'll translate over in Australia, but um, it's a wonderful resource. And you can actually find that on our um, Facebook group, Teaching Piano Safari. Um, so there's a blog right. post can anyone just join posted that? there this week. Anyone can join. Yes, you just have to request and then we will approve you. So right. if you're a piano teacher, yeah, if you're a piano teacher, we'll find, um, <laughs> yeah. perhaps you can send me the link to that. We'll pop it on the show notes. Okay. Okay. So does your method work for older kids? I know it works for younger kids. What about teenagers, for example, or adults even? I think all of the concepts um, are definitely important. Um, the pedagogy behind it will work for any age, but obviously um, our books right near, now are geared toward the younger student. Um, our next project is writing an older beginner version, actually, uh -huh. that um, just has more mature pictures and themes to it so that we can use that pedagogy, um, but make it more attractive to an older child, um, a teenager or an adult. Yep. So we're hoping to um, come out with that soon. We, we always have lots of ideas and projects um, on our plate, but that one <laughs> is high on the priority list because we know that's really needed. Great. Yeah. I have, um, I have three adult students currently. And what I do when they're beginners is use components of Piano Safari and then, um, other books as well. So I have a kind of a mishmash, but all students, um, whether they're in Piano Safari or not, whether they're kids or adults, go through the sight reading cards, all of them. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the method consists of the repertoire book, the sight reading cards, and a listening component. Um, and we're soon writing theory books to go with them also. That's yet an, another project coming up. <laughs> you guys um, be so we feel that the sight reading cards are crucial. And I've had the adults say to me time uh, over and over, like, uh, I can really feel my sight reading getting better through mm -hmm. working on these cards because they don't have pictures, so they're ageless. <laughs> well, if I could give you one little bit of uh, advice, one thing I love about the books of the series is that there is only one book, really. <laughs> um, yeah. And you look at some of the other methods and, you know, you have to buy the technique, the artistry, the pop, the, you know, air, all that kind of stuff. So um, I, I would I would personally... I really like that it's not many books that you have to buy to use it. So uh, just be wary of adding too many things on because suddenly teachers have to, and over here in Australia, it's not all that cheap. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, to, thank you for that um, feedback. That's, I don't know if you've that's how we feel that. too. Hmm. Yeah, as a teacher, I've always been more drawn to an all-in-one type book. So Yeah. yeah. yeah and so uh, your, your, re your resources... Um, yeah, it does come it comes with a CD, which has got backing tracks, but you've also got those online too, haven't you? I think, is that right? Well, our CD, um, yes. So our CD, um, it comes digitally, and in the U.S. you can get a hard copy, but we're trying to move to all digital. Yeah. Um, at any rate, the CD has the um, performances of the rote pieces um, and the technique exercises. So anything that's not learned from notation is on the CD. Mm. Um, this is it's like the Suzuki idea that the student should be listening to um, artistic performances of what they're playing in order to gain musical understanding and to um, have it in their ear before they learn it. So um, students are intended to listen to that CD. So when they come into a lesson to learn a rote piece, they've heard it before and are excited to learn it and are already familiar with it. Well, Catherine, that's a brilliant segue into the rote teaching, which I wanted to ask you about. <laughs> Yes. Why is this so important in the early days of teaching? Yes. So um, I think Julie mentioned earlier, uh, we have been um, discovering more and more of the benefits over the years that we've been teaching by rote. So first of all, I just want to define what we mean by it, because I feel like it's a controversial topic and in terms of um, people misunderstand the word. No, that's a good idea. Somewhat. So... Um, we've always defined it as a systematic introduction of musical and artistic concepts that are best introduced by modeling rather than from a notated score. And the word systematic here is very important because good road teaching shouldn't be haphazard um, or, or just, you know, picking something randomly to teach by rote. We always have a purpose behind what we are teaching by rote, either to develop the student's technique um, artistry or understanding of patterns. So there has to be a plan behind it. Um, some things that rote teaching uh, will enhance. One big one is motivation. Um, rote pieces provide students with musically interesting pieces to play right from the beginning. 
So we've all had that experience of a young student coming into the lesson for the first time, and they're just excited about playing the piano. So we want to reward that enthusiasm by, um, you know, not just pulling out a book and saying, this is what, you know, middle C looks like, but by actually teaching them a piece that they can go home and share with their family right from the start. Um, so another benefit would be concentration. Our row pieces are often much longer than the traditional method uh, book reading piece of it's usually about eight measures, I'd say, right? An early level reading piece. Some of our earliest rope pieces, such as I Love Coffee, um, are very long for a young beginner. I Love Coffee is in six variations. So we work with our young students to be able to play all six variations in order without losing their concentration in the middle and being able to perform that. And so um, that's just one small example of how it can develop concentration in a young student. Um, yeah, just moving on, um, another thing that rote teaching can enhance is technique. Um, rote pieces enable students to take their eyes away from the score um, and focus their full visual attention on what they're doing technically. Mm. And then on the, the other side of that is what they're listening to, their artistry. Um, a teacher can model uh, uh, and the student can copy the sound, yeah. which yeah. requires intense listening Mm, no, it's, it really just, does help the students connect with the music rather than the reading. And it's so important in those early days. And my little student who I tried out your method on, Josh, at, at my school, he loved the I Love Coffee uh, piece. Uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, he played, we played it so many times. And he eventually did it for a school assembly and everyone loved it. And, like, it, it was just great. And, and it's, it's long enough that a beginner student can per perform it, which is you know, pretty mm -hmm. rare. And everyone knows the, like it's, for those of you who don't know it, it's it's a fairly well-known variation <laughs> on a well-known theme. Uh, and uh, it's it's just, it was it was great fun to teach. As a teacher, just to get away from the, the music reading and just have fun with the student. I, I really, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it. So I think that is such a great part of your method, these, these rote pieces. Well, thank you. Yes, um, I, you, I agree. It's so much fun. Um, to teach these. And students, uh, they just have so much enthusiasm for them. Um, several of the beginning uh, rote pieces, I Love Coffee and Hungry Herbie Hippo, um, since there are different variations and different transpositions, um, in the case of Her Herbie Hippo, I've done these with my group classes as ensembles. Mm. And those are always a really a big recital hit, um, especially um, for each student to take a variation or a different key. Um, and we go through and we cycle through and, and play those too. So, and how important for you is helping students understand the concept of transposition because there's a, a little bit of that that goes on early on too. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the piece I just mentioned, Hungry Herbie Hippo, um, they learn that in five different keys. So, um, and that's going to be a bit just right from the start, teachers to hear that. Right. <laughs> and of course, at this point, they're not this is from their first lesson. So they're not understanding key signatures or exactly what they're doing, but they know they can play it in, in five different starting locations on the piano, which um, is another benefit of rote teaching. They're learning the keyboard geography that way and, and just being able to get around the keyboard and use more of the range of the keyboard than just a very limited position like an early uh, level reading piece would require. So. Mm. Yeah, and you guys, you of, guys use the whole piano all the time. From mm -hmm. Top, yeah, bottom, yeah. it's all over the place, which is great. And the rope pieces are especially composed to capitalize on those keyboard patterns. Um, so we don't just pick any piece to be a rope piece. Um, it's specifically a set of um, white and black key patterns um, so that they become familiar with the keyboard geography. And um, I think that also helps their transposition, too, because they play around with those pieces starting on different keys and figure out what works mm. with the different pieces. Do you think we're finally getting to a point with uh, piano teachers and pedagogy where this the concept of rote teaching is becoming an accepted way to <laughs> teach? Because it's been, it's, it's you know, a lot of teachers are like, no, you know, it's got to be reading, it's got to be reading. Right. I feel like it's more and more talked about, especially if, if you read through, you know, some of the Facebook teacher forums, um, this is a topic that comes up frequently. So um, although it's still controversial in some ways, I feel like there is more understanding 
um, and that understanding is growing that um, rote teaching will not inhibit a student's reading, but it can actually help a student's reading in the long run because um, they're going to be playing more musically, more rhythmically with better, better technique. And they're experiencing all of these things that they can bring to their reading pieces later rather than trying to develop those concepts from a reading piece first. Yeah, while so. they're also working on the reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Plus exactly. in Piano Safari, we firmly believe that they should um, begin both by rote and by reading at the same time, but they have a different body of pieces for each concept. So they have their rote pieces and they have their reading. So we don't delay the reading for two years or anything like that mm -hmm. um, because we don't want their reading to get so far behind. We do them both at the same time. And I found that when I was teaching, uh, I would have the rote piece in front of me for reference. Maybe that was not how mm -hmm. I should be doing it. I'm not sure. And I would find no, we do that, that too. Yeah, that Josh would be looking at it and he'd be noticing what's going on in the music and kind of where I'm at. And I would show because he would ask questions, you know, and I would show him where he's at. So he's getting, even though he's not reading the music, he's getting an appreciation for patterns and what things look like, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't, that was a little side benefit, I thought. Yes, especially in level two, as the students um, have been growing in their reading, the rote playing level and their reading level are much closer. So mm. they can read huge elements of their, their rote pieces. So it's neat to see how that starts to come together. Mm. You know, at, in the very earliest lessons, they're not looking at the score much at all, except for maybe the lyrics. Um, and, and by the end of book two, um, they're really able to decode much of their rote pieces. Mm, and we've also noticed that um, students aren't scared of a complex looking score because they've seen that up um, on the piano all along. So we feel that actually helps um, them even in a reading piece. Uh, the reading pieces comparatively don't look as difficult. And they're like, I can do this. You know, mm. I can master and figure this out. So. Well, let's talk about the Piano Safari approach to reading and teaching reading. How, how does that work? Um, we have a very systematic uh, way of presenting reading. Um, both Catherine and I, uh, when we were teaching all sorts of different methods before Piano Safari existed, um, we had settled on the music tree and the intervallic method as being the best way to teach children to read. We found that our students who had gone through the music tree and learned intervallically were the most solid readers as a whole. And of just, course, you can just always. Just in case there's anyone give, listening who don't, oh, doesn't know what the intervallic approach is, could you just give us a oh, quick rundown? What's the difference? Um, that's it's not reading by note name, note by note, but instead you are reading by um, interval and by contour. So you find your starting note and then you're reading up, 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 down, down, down by different intervals. Great. Yep. So um, so we knew we wanted an intervallic approach when we started writing Piano Safari. And um, the, the system is super systematic because the more we teach, the more we realize that teaching reading takes a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it takes an extraordinary amount of time for students to become fluent readers, um, except for the occasional brilliant born reader. I was one of those. I don't say I'm brilliant. <laughs> I didn't know that I was could a thing. always read somehow. <laughs> Um, so when I started teaching, um, I noticed that my students were not like that, that they struggled with reading. And I was like, what is going on here? So we really wanted to find the best way to teach the majority of children to read, um, to read well. And uh, if you think about students learning to read and write English, it takes a good four years before they're really fluent, unless you're um, Catherine's children, <laughs> who are just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> they just love to read and learn to read yeah. early. But, yeah. but um, in schools, uh, at least in the U.S., the hope is that all children will be reading at grade level by third grade. So at that point, they've had kindergarten, first, second and third grade, four years to become fluent English readers. And yet sometimes at the piano, we expect students to become really good music readers right away within mm. a few months. And mm. if it doesn't happen, we're like, well, maybe the kid will just never be a good reader. So. Yeah. And we give up too soon. So we um, we advocate sticking to a system and seeing it through over the long haul. And our system, um, we start pre-staff with finger numbers because we really feel it's important for children to learn their finger numbers and to realize that finger twos are your index fingers, even though they're on opposite sides of the hand, <laughs> which takes a little bit of convincing for some of the kids. 
uh, to count your fingers starting from your thumb. Um, and then after a period of pre-reading, we go into the staff. Uh, we have landmark notes of treble G on a line and base C on a space. And all the reading pieces and sight reading cards in level one start on one of those notes, but they start on different fingers so that the student doesn't start to think one is G, which mm. is not true mm. the time. Um, and then we start with seconds and unisons, and we have them um, with a colored pencil mark the unisons. Um, and you would be surprised when they're first starting to read at how long it takes for them to find the unisons or sames and mark them. Like it's easy for us, but it's not easy for them. So mm -hmm. we find that marking the intervals really helps them analyze each piece and card before they try to play it. And then they just read from G up, up, down, down, whatever the direction um, is. And then in the next unit, so they have an entire unit of just seconds and then an entire unit of just reading thirds. Um, and we, we do this because we feel that a lot of methods will combine the two too soon. So a method might have a few pages of seconds, a few pages of thirds, some note names thrown in there, and then um, throw it all together and, and hope that they get it, which they often don't. <laughs> yeah. um, so we have an extended period of seconds, an extended period of thirds before we finally combine the intervals. And then in book um, two, we add fifths and then fourths. Uh, fourths are the hardest to read, which is why we save them for last. Mm. And then in book three, we move into a more multi-key approach where they're learning their scales, chord progressions, chord inversions, and accompaniment patterns like Alberti bass. So they're still, they're finding patterns, um, which they've been trained to do all along because the rope pieces are all made of patterns. Mm -hmm. So they're used to the idea that music is patterns. Um, so they, and then we also introduce note names on the grand staff in book, at the beginning of book two, because of course they also need to know their note names. So they're reading mostly by interval and then they start getting faster at recognizing their note names so that by level three, they're able to put it all together, um, with chord progressions and, uh, read with patterns, note names and intervals all at the same time. <laughs> so so that's the short. Yeah. I'm a, <laughs> I, we should I'm... also say in, uh, sorry, in book two, uh, they don't always begin on the landmark notes anymore. We also move away from that. So after they've learned how to find all of the notes on the grand staff, then they're playing in a variety of keys. And also, um, I have written a six or seven part blog series on reading, which we're in the middle of releasing each part. So I think we've released parts one, two, and three on our blog that explains this concept of reading more thoroughly. Mm, great. Well, definitely. Let's get some links for that. Yeah. To, uh, to share with everyone as well. Uh, how did you choose those two landmark notes? And why didn't you choose, for example, middle C or base mm -hmm. F and treble G, for example? There was a very specific reason for that. So if you think about the treble clef G and the bass clef C, they're both basically central uh, to the staff. So we could start on a variety of finger numbers and, uh, and avoid too many ledger line notes. So that was one reason. But the other very important reason is that in our unit with all thirds, we had to have students see that the um, notes can move thirds, go from a line to a line or a space to a space. So if we had chosen all line landmarks, middle C, treble G, and base F, for example, they would have only seen thirds going from line to line. Very good. So they're not going to find, uh, teachers won't find any uh, every good boy deserves thingy and, and those kind of explanations in your books. <laughs> No, at the beginning of book two, we have um, our system for teaching note names on the staff, which combines the base and treble staff. So students learn their skips alphabet, um, which is uh, thirds on the piano all the way up, F-A-C-E-G-B-D. And if they memorize that, that's all they really need to know mm -hmm. to find all the notes on the staff. Um, and then we give them flashcards and lots of games and other ways to practice their note names. Um, there is a video explaining that whole thing which we'll send you so that you can you can maybe put that on the show notes also. Great. This is going to be a, 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 an epic show notes page, I can tell. <laughs> well, one of, the, one of the other benefits of your approach is the online resources. You guys have put so much time and effort into creating resources for teachers and parents, for that matter, and the students themselves online. And I think this is invaluable for beginners because we expect them to do so much at home and how can we expect them to do that if they've got no resources or references? So what kind of things will teachers find on your site 
for teaching and, and how do you encourage them to use those resources? Sure. Well, first of all, um, on our website, we do have teacher's guides for um, our repertoire uh, books one and two, actually everything um, that we have. We also have teacher's guides for the sight reading cards and how to use those. So these are very extensive step-by-step -step guides uh, that will give teachers ideas about how to teach each piece. And um, also we have some ideas for games uh, such as in level one um, games for finding the white keys on the piano, for example. Um, so those are um, quite extensive and they can be downloaded for free for teachers. We also have three kinds of videos. So the first, kind is the reminder video and these are for all of the rote pieces and technical exercises so this is more of a resource for the student and parent uh, the, the reminder videos are um, ordered alphabetically by book so uh, it's fairly easy for the parent to go on and find the rote piece the students working on and the reminder video is literally just a mini tutorial um, where you can see um, our hand playing the piece and um, just some comments along the way. For example, like Charlie Chipmunk starts on the first uh, group black key in a group of two, and then you'll see the hand play through Charlie Chipmunk. So that's a very valuable resource because one of the questions we get most is, if I teach a student a row piece, how are they going to remember it during the week at home? Mm -hmm. Good question. And that's exactly what the reminder videos are for. Mm. So we also have instructional videos um, for a few of the rope pieces. And these are just Julie and I teaching um, a rope piece so teachers can have a better understanding of how to do that since it's a little outside the box for some people who have never tried to teach uh, a student without using the score um, as a reference. And then the last type of video are performance videos. And these are just supposed to be motivational and fun for students to watch. They are just um, other children playing um, some of the pieces. So three kinds of videos. Mm. Um, we also have um, a blog, as Julie mentioned earlier, she's uh, right now posting about sight reading on our blog. So we update that frequently. Um, we also have mini essays. Uh, Julie wrote these about, they're just um, basically essays about teaching beginners, all elements of teaching. They are great. Too. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed them, Julie. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. My dissertation is on there too. If you have a lot of coffee. It's a nearly a thousand page uh, dissertation. <laughs> so we should just warn everyone right now. <laughs> I've always had the best intentions of reading people's PhDs, but I never get much further than the abstract. Of, of <laughs> <laughs> so that is there. Um, and then, of course, our Facebook resources, we have a, a Piano Safari page and the group we've mentioned a few times called Teaching Piano Safari. So uh, for teachers who have questions um, about a certain element of teaching or, or anything about Piano Safari, they can post those there and um, there's good discussions that happen. Yeah, so for teachers who are listening and who uh, currently have been following the method of choice for a number of years, uh, they can rest assured that if they try this out and maybe you advocate just trying it out with one student first or two students, I'm not sure. It'd be interesting to know your thoughts on that. Uh, they can rest assured that there is a lot of resources online to help. Literally in, in level one at least, and perhaps for, for further, uh, I found that I could find in, an instructional sheet, almost a lesson plan for each piece that I was needing to teach and your techniques and ideas, how to do it, remember to not teach legato this and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. should, um, should, should, should teachers, um, if, if they're going to be trying out your method, would you encourage them to just try it out with one or two students first uh, and see how it goes? I would suggest um, finding a seven-year-old or an eight-year-old. Um, we definitely use Piano Safari with children as young as four. Uh, but of course, it's a different ball game to teach a four or five year old than it is an older child. So if you're trying out a new method, it might be good to choose one that's seven or eight years old. Um, and also uh, to have them do both the repertoire book and the sight reading cards because they definitely are meant to go together. Mm. So Great. <laughs> All right. Well, look, we're going to start wrapping up. Uh, I would you know, could keep talking about this for ages because I've got so many, <laughs> so many questions, and I, I love the concepts of of how you've pulled in all these different 
approaches to teaching into this method. Um, but have you got maybe five tips just for teachers generally teaching beginner piano students? What what would they be? Well, one tip um, is to build a solid foundation and not rush the early stages. Um, Tim, I actually listened to Irina Gorin's podcast that you did with her. Mm. Um, it was really inspiring. And I, and one thing that I totally agreed with her about was that, um, every child should be taught properly, whatever their career goals. And that the beginning teacher is the most important because that's what lays all the foundations. So we definitely agree with her on that one. Um, John Weems, who was in my dissertation research, he had this great analogy about a rubber band. He said that he holds the students back at the beginning until all their technique is perfect um, and all the foundations are there. Um, and after he holds them back in the beginning stages, he lets the rubber band go. And then suddenly, as he said, they're playing Prokofiev sonatas. <laughs> so, I'm sure there's some in the middle there, but I really that um, uh, found that revolutionary that you should not rush the beginning stages, but make sure you get it right for every kid. Um, and then they can just snowball and progress. And we've seen that with piano safari too, especially if they start young, it might take them quite a, quite a while to get through level one, um, and then level two. But by the time they get to level three, they're just sailing through, um, mm -hmm. super fast because all the foundations have been set. So building a, a solid foundation and not rushing the early stages is one tip. Mm, mm -hmm. right. And another one um, we have is that technical training should be one of the most important components of beginning lessons. Um, I've spoken with you know many teachers over the years, and sometimes you'll find the philosophy that um, they don't work on a student's technique or hand position too much or worry about it too much in the beginning, feeling that um, it'll work itself out. Um, or that the student will somehow, you know, find the best way to play for them. But Julie and I very much uh, feel that we, we want to train them to play um, properly from the beginning so they don't form bad habits that are, as we've said earlier, harder to undo later. Mm, absolutely. Uh, another, yeah. Another tip is um, that students need much more repetition than we might think, mm. especially in the realm of reading. Uh, as, as I said before, it takes quite a long time for them to become fluent readers. So we need to keep working on that week after week, month after month, year after year, until we see the fruit. Yeah, I, like, I liked your analogy to how long it takes a student to learn to read a book, uh, you know, English. Right. Three or four years, yeah. four years. Uh, and we yeah, do expect years. it so quickly. <laughs> when it's so much, it's probably almost harder in music in some ways. So, uh, yeah, I think it is because it's in real time. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. reading music is in real time, and it's not so. just coordinating your mouth, which you can always you can do from a baby. It's coordinating ten of these. Like it's yeah, it's a yeah. great, it's crazy. Several really. different lines. What yeah, we ask them to do. It's complicated. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. So I think that was tip number three. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Number mm -hmm. four is to meet the children in a developmentally appropriate way for their age. So that's where the stuffed animals come in. Um, so you would approach them in um, a playful way and make piano lessons joyful and playful. Um, and I always know that I'm doing things right when the student will say to me, oh, can I play that again? Or, oh, mm. wait, I think I made a mistake. Can I try that again? And I'm so happy to say, yes, you can. But from the beginning, I've, I've trained them that piano is a joyful place. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be strict, but we're going to have fun. Um, so when I see them taking ownership for that when they're a little older, that is just great to to see the progress. And it was very a lot of fun watching you teach your students in your videos. So for those <laughs> list, for those people listening, you'll be able to see actually Julie. Uh, I think, is, Catherine, do you have videos of your teaching on there as well? I can't remember. Some yeah. of the instructional videos, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But certainly Julie teaching her little kids mm -hmm. is just phenomenal. It's it's, it's really yeah, inspiring. Yeah, that, that little student is coming in 15 minutes for her lesson. It's B. <laughs> we named her B. And there's three lessons of her on there. Um, and then she told me one day, she said, Zechariah Zebra does not like to be videotaped. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I get the message. She doesn't want to be videotaped for a while, but she's doing great. Um, and those lessons are, of course, not perfect because children are not perfect and don't do things perfectly every time. But it was just a little picture into one student's training for a little bit. <laughs> well, I found teachers, uh, certainly in my community, they love watching other teachers teach. It's, it's so fundamentally rewarding to see what other teachers are doing if not for new ideas, just for, for backup that, you know, we all 
make crazy mistakes and we all yeah. struggle sometimes and that's all totally cool. That's part of being a teacher. Mm -hmm. and, and tip um, number five, number five is to... Is yeah, to be patient and enjoy the process. <laughs> be patient. And kind of sums process. everything up. Just that um, with the students needing repetition and not to rush the early stages, and um, for for teachers just to um, you know feel good about that. That if you're doing a thorough job and a careful job of working with your students, then you can just enjoy the process and and it, let it happen, and and have fun with that. And they certainly will have fun with uh, with your method. So I, I encourage anyone to to try it out. I'm certainly, I've, I've got no commissions from you or anything like that. It's it's purely. Uh, <laughs> I I really love what you're doing. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for the efforts that you're putting into creating this brilliant method. Uh, and I hope other teachers try it out. Thank you. And in Australia, we recently got a distributor there. Uh, so uh, um, Rachel, it used to it? be. It used mm -hmm. to be that you had to pay exorbitant shipping costs from the U.S., but now you don't have to anymore because we are in-country in Australia, um, shipping from Melbourne. Uh, so we're very happy about that. And does that mean on your website we can buy in Australian dollars or is that U.S. still? Yes. Yes. Aussie mm -hmm. dollars. Great. Australian dollars. Very, very cool. All right. That's that's uh, another bonus for us over here. Um so where should people go if they're listening and they're on their treadmill and they just cannot wait to find out more about you? Where do they go? <laughs> they should just go directly to our website, which is pianosafari.com. And you can order from our site and find all of those resources as I mentioned earlier as well. Yeah, that's great. And, and yep. look, so much of it is free online. I mean, really the only thing you're selling is the books. The method, mm -hmm, the method right. books. So just go on there and start reading, and I guarantee you'll be pretty blown away by the things that uh, these two fabulous women are giving away on their site, and you'll be wanting to try <laughs> out one of their books for sure. So look, I do, uh, I do commend it to everyone who's listening. Check it out if uh, if you're interested in uh, a great beginning approach. Uh, thank you very much for your time, both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for this opportunity, Tim. You're absolutely welcome. Will we be able to catch up at um, NCKP next year in Chicago? Are you guys going to be there? We will. And we'll also be at MTNA in Baltimore. Fantastic. Great. Well, I won't be in Baltimore, but I'll definitely be in Chicago. So I look forward to uh, we can have a little hangout, uh, maybe have a nice yes. chat. Uh, that'd be great fun. <laughs> Sounds Brilliant. good. All right, guys, I'll leave you to it. Thank you so much again for your time. We'll speak to you soon. Thank Sounds you. Good. Thanks. Bye. Okay, bye. Hi, everyone. It's Tim here again. Uh, thank you very much for listening to or watching today's episode. Uh, I do hope you got something out of it. I put them together to be as relevant and useful to you in your studio and your teaching uh, as possible. So uh, do let me know your feedback. If you've got any questions, uh, comments, critique, whatever it is, you can email me at admin at timtopham.com. Now, before we go, I did want to mention a few little reminders. Firstly, if you're looking for transcripts, Transcripts of every episode from episode 50 onwards are available at the show notes page. And you can either view the transcript on screen or you can download a PDF that you can use uh, to research and um, refer to. To find the show notes of any episode of Tim Topham TV, just type in timtopham.com slash episode and then the number. So e.g. timtopham.com slash episode 20. Now, as you may have heard, I am offering currently you guys, my loyal podcast listeners, some of the most dedicated teachers I know, a $100 discount off annual membership of my inner circle. The code you need to access that is TTTV podcast, all one word. And the place you're going to find out more about what you get for membership, the benefits, hear some testimonials of current members. The place you go is timtopham.com slash community. Finally, if you have a suggestion for a guest, I would always love to hear about it. A lot of you guys have some fantastic connections. So if you're thinking of anyone that would be really cool to interview, please email me admin at timtopham.com. We'll get to me and uh, I look forward to hearing from you and we'll see you in the next episode. If the idea of a piano teacher's community where you get to access the best educational resources, rub shoulders with expert teachers from around the world, and have immediate access to feedback for any of your questions, then Inner Circle membership is for you. The Inner Circle is my private community of piano teachers from across the globe who share a commitment to creating and delivering the most inspiring, modern, and progressive learning experiences for their students. Membership is now open, so head to timtopham.com forward slash community to find out more and get involved today. I can't wait to see you on the inside.